going to get you to open up to John uh, chapter 7. We're going to be in this text for the next two weeks, uh, and I'm going to do something a little bit differently than what you guys might be used to. I'm going to, this morning, just try to focus on the there and then. What was happening there, what was happening then, to give you a sense of the historical picture so that you can kind of enter into the story. And then next week, I'm going to kind of take that story and, and, and look at it from the here and now. What does this mean for us today? So really, if if it would be like the application part is coming next week and kind of the Bible part is coming uh, this week, uh, but, but it's because I didn't want to do one really, really long uh, sermon. So you're going to get two shorter ones. Well, we'll see if it's any shorter. I always say that and it's always the exact same amount of time that they usually are. Um, so John chapter 7. Hey, before we get to John chapter 7, um, you probably know that rituals are an inevitable part of life. The morning of August 31st, 2003 uh, was packed with nervous anticipation for me because I was getting married that day. And, and, and this was a, like a big deal, right? It was a big deal to me. I was forging a whole new kind of life direction. And I knew that a lot of stuff was going to change beyond just having matching towels and no longer drinking orange juice out of the container. I knew that other stuff was going to change because I was pledging my life to another person for as long as we both shall live. And I was really excited about that. Now, our wedding ceremony started when... The pastor and the groomsmen and myself, we came out from the wings of, of the church onto the stage and we stood there on the platform waiting, fidgeting and smiling and nodding at people and waiting until the bridesmaids came out one by one and they did that ridiculously slow glacier walk that bridesmaids do where they go step, pause, step, pause and I was like so filled with anticipation I just wanted to run down there and kind of like push them up the front to, because as great as they look that's not who I was wanting to see and then the doors closed and the music changed and everybody stood up and then the, the theme song for Hockey Night in Canada came on <laughs> dun, 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 dun. no it didn't all right. I, I opted for that and it got vetoed, so that didn't happen. But everybody stood up and then the doors swung open. And I remember the, the kind of the church we got married in, my wife came in off the wing. And so everybody's standing, so I can't see her at first. All I see is the top of her head and I'm stretching and I'm trying to see her because I, I just want to get a look at her. And then... embarrassing um, then I was doing the same thing then that I'm doing now right then she comes and she comes down the aisle and and my wife has always been stunning right and she's always been beautiful but but never has she looked so beautiful as as that morning right and and like so she looked so good that there was like an audible gasp in the audience I'm not kidding there was like a gasp when she came in and three-quarters of the people are gasping because she looks so amazing and one quarter are gasping because they're like how does this gangly curly haired guy with big eyebrows land that right I know that's what they're thinking doesn't really matter the point is I did that's the point <laughs> that matters and so she's coming down the aisle, and even though the church is packed with all these people that we love, and even though there's packed with people who traveled all this distance to get there, she's not looking at them. Right? She's looking at me, right? And only me. And she's got this smile that's like only for me. And I'm standing there grinning and shaking and leaking all at once. <laughs> Right? I'm just trying to take this all in. Now, now, here's the thing. Up until that point, the ritual of weddings was just a ritual. And, and kind of a boring one at that, if I was honest. You know, you'd come to a church and some pastor would get up and he'd say some forgettable words about love. And, and then they'd, they'd play the same music and, and they'd kind of say the same vows and they'd give the same symbol. And everybody is basically dressed the same, except for you brides, you guys were totally unique. But everybody else was kind of totally the same. And so it didn't have a lot of weight or didn't have a lot of meaning to me until it became about me. Until I was personally included in the ritual. Once it was my wedding, something changed. 
And when I saw my bride smiling at me, all those scriptures that talk about, you know, Christ as the bridegroom and us as the bride made sense to me. That Christ sees the church the same way I saw my bride. That Christ anticipates and longs for her to get closer to him the same way that I long for my wife to make her way down the aisle to come join me. You see, in that moment, because I was a part of the ritual, something was happening that was bigger than the ritual that changed me and changed how I see the ritual forever. Now, weddings aren't a boring ritual to me when I go to them. Because they point to something bigger than, them, them, uh, bigger than themselves. Now, when I get to do a, a wedding and, and you know, the, the doors close and the people stand up and the music change and the doors open, you know where I look? I look at the face of the groom. Do you know why? And I think that's like Jesus' face. And then I look at the bride, dressed in white, beautiful, and I think, that's us. That's how Jesus sees us. Holy, beautiful. Can't, he's just like filled with joyful anticipation for us to get closer and closer to Him. You see, the ritual now has power and meaning because it points to something bigger than just itself. That is the potential that rituals have. Now, this brings us to John chapter 7. Because John chapter 7 is an unbelievable encounter that Jesus has with people. And it's probably actually the second most dramatic thing that Jesus does publicly, other than his crucifixion, happens in John chapter 7. But for you to understand the drama and the intensity and the, and the power of the moment, you need to understand some of the ritual, some of the ceremony that this event takes place in. Because Jesus is going to come to a Jewish ritual, a Jewish ceremony, and he's going, to, he's going to blow the ritual open. And he's going to point to something far bigger, far more powerful than some simple ceremony. And his words have incredible implication for you and me. But Jesus' words, where, where we read them and we'll get to, we'll get to there eventually, they, they can, if you don't know the ritual, they can come to you like a tagline or like a tweet. But because they're embedded in ritual, they have so much more power, but you only know it, only see it, can only experience it if you know some of the ritual, if you put yourself in that ritual. If you don't understand it, then Jesus' words in John chapter 7, they become merely a, you know, a spiritual coffee cup slogan instead of a promise that can change your world and mine. So to make that happen, this morning I'm going to try to bring you into the ritual, try to make it come alive for you so that you can understand and feel what it was like when Jesus spoke. And the next week we'll talk about the implications of Jesus' words for us. Now John chapter 7 begins um, after uh, Jesus had just given the bread of life discourse in John chapter 6. This is that part where I like to call the zombie sermon. Where Jesus gets up and he tells the people, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And his disciples are like, oh no, don't say that. Because people, all these people who have been following Jesus, he's been wildly popular at this time, they're like, what are you talking about? And they're confused and they, and they don't understand the, the full implications and weight of his words. And so he, he's getting too hard and he's getting too controversial. And a whole bunch of people leave Jesus. They don't want to follow him anymore. And so you can imagine this is a tense time for Jesus. But it gets more intense by the minute because the start of John chapter 7 tells us these words. It says, after this, Jesus traveled in Galilee. Since he did not want to travel to Judea, since the Jews were trying to kill him. Whenever John uses the words the Jews, he means the religious leaders, the enemies of God, the power brokers in Israel who were hostile to Jesus. And so Jesus is a wanted man in Jerusalem. The Jews want him assassinated, want him taken out. And now the intensity begins to grow because we read these words. The Jewish feast of tabernacles was near. Now to understand a bit about what's going to happen in John chapter 7, you need to understand a little bit about this feast, the feast of tabernacles. 
There are seven major feasts and festivals in the Jewish calendar. And of the seven, the Feast of Tabernacles is the seventh one, the last one in the calendar year. And, and it is the most joyous of all the feasts and festivals. In fact, it's like a party that lasts seven days. And it was really, really well attended for two reasons. One is because it was like such a festive, fun atmosphere that people wanted to be there. And two, it is one of the three feasts and festivals that had mandatory attendance. If you were a Jew over the age of 21, you were expected to come and attend the Festival of Tabernacles. Now the Festival of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, as, as it's sometimes called, both are the same things, it happened after the harvest. So you can imagine all the crops were in, all the work is done, the storehouses are filled, people have got a ton of stuff, and so there's a whole like celebratory mood across the land, and it would inaugurate what the Jews would call the season of gladness. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles had two purposes. One purpose was to look backwards at something in the past, to remember and celebrate something in the past, and the other purpose was to look forward and anticipate something that was to come. And both of these are really important. Now what they looked backwards at the past was they looked backward at the Exodus, what we just taught through. All the whole time that the Jews wandered in the wilderness, they, they, um, where they, they lived in these temporary structures they called booths, so they would build these little lean-tos out of sticks, and that's what the people lived in when they were in the desert. And, and, uh, and it, you know, living in the booths helped them anticipate going into the promised land where they finally had a home, where they finally had abundance, where they finally had security. And so we read about this in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24. And it says this, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins and lasts for seven days. And the first day, you are to take choice fruits from the trees, palm fronds, leafy branches and poplars, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths so that your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. So the city of Jerusalem would be just crammed full of people that were making these little structures, these little lean-tos out of sticks, and, you know, flat roof buildings would have them on top, and alleyways would have them all down the streets, and every field outside the city limits would have these booths, you know, pop out where people would sleep in and live in for seven days. It was like a giant family camp out. And everybody would come together. And so you can imagine kids are running around and playing and, you know, people after the harvest is done, they're catching up and they're, it's, it's like a week-long national family vacation. And everybody comes to one spot. Now the second purpose wasn't just to look back and remember the exodus. The second purpose uh, purpose was to look forward and anticipate the final spiritual harvest when God's salvation would come to all the nations and the mission of Israel would be done. So there was this anticipation of what God was yet to do in history. And so for seven days, the people would participate in this elaborate ritual. They would gather at the Temple Mount and in one hand they would carry a citrus fruit to remember all the, the bounty and blessing that they got from the promised land. So they would carry this around to remember that God brought them to a land that was, you know, provided good things. And then they would, in obedience to Leviticus 23, they would take three different branches and they'd weave them together into something called a lulav. And they'd bring these branches and they'd wave them during worship. And there's symbols between each one of the branches, which we won't even get into right now. But so they would gather at the temple every day for seven days, and they would sing the halal. Now, halal is Hebrew for praise. That's what halal means. So, praise to Yahweh is hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's praise to Yahweh. So they sing the halal, which is Psalms 113, which we read this morning, up to 118. 
And they would have all those five psalms. They'd have them memorized and they would chant them all together and they'd be led by you know, a choir of tens of thousands of Levites. The temple priests would lead them in, in chanting and singing the halal. And his, you know, history writers tell us that up to three million people would gather on the temple mount. That's Josephus. He's prone to exaggeration. So even if we cut that in half, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people coming gathering with their fruit, their palm branches, they're waving their palm branches, and they're together chanting the halal. Now, we're also told that the whole ceremony that would happen during this five uh, these seven days were kind of anchored in two main scriptures. And I'm, I'm going to read these scriptures to you. And I want you to notice the future kind of prophetic anticipation that is in these texts. Okay? So the first one is Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. We read this. Indeed, God is my salvation. I will trust Him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. And on that day, a particular day in the future, you will say, give thanks to Yahweh, proclaim His name, celebrate His works among the people. Okay, I want you to notice a couple things. Joyfully draw water. So that's kind of a theme. And this idea is on that day, a particular day. So the rabbis paired this text with another prophetic text from uh, Zechariah chapter 14, which reads these words. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. Half of it towards the eastern sea, the other half towards the western sea, in summer and winter alike. On that day, Yahweh will become king over all the earth. Yahweh alone, His name alone. Then... All the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. So you have these prophecies talking about a day that is to come, the day of the Lord, where living water would flow from the temple, flowing out in every direction, bringing life and salvation. You partner that with, you know, the incredible prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 47, which is this long narrative of this picture of the river of life flowing out of the temple. And wherever the river goes, it brings life and healing and abundance. And it just flows out to the ends of the earth. This incredible prophetic picture. And since this was to happen at the Feast of Tabernacles, the rabbi said, we need to do something in our ceremony to acknowledge and anticipate this day that is coming when living water will flow out from the temple. And so what they crafted is they crafted what was known as the water ceremony. Stay with me. Are you still with me? Okay, stay with me. They crafted something called the water ceremony where they would acknowledge that at some day in the future that water, living water is going to flow from the temple. And the ceremony would go like this. The high priest would lead a procession of the people from the temple. And they would lead the temple through, uh, like out of the city and into what is called the water gate. And they go to the lower city and the people would begin to follow. And the people were lining the streets and they got their palm branches. And guess what they're singing? They're singing the halal. They're chanting the halal. Some 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 118. They're chanting that in unison right from start to finish. And the, the priest would walk down about a half a mile to the Pool of Shalom. You probably have a map in the back of your book of Jerusalem and you can see it there. Now the Pool of Shalom was a place that was known as living water in Jerusalem because it was water that is fed by a spring. Water that is just kind of pooled up is not called living water. water that's, living water has to be flowing. It has to be fresh. And so if you know history, Hezekiah dug a tunnel from this pool that was outside the city gates, you know, in underground, which you can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel. I've walked through it. It was really, really um, cool experience. You got a headlamp on, you're like, oh, this is fresh living water until I shine my light down and there was a big turd floating right in the water there. True story, which kind of ruined this whole image of like living water for me. But anyway, I didn't too much information. I'm walking through Hezekiah's tunnel like, ooh, ooh, flushing stuff out of the way and trying to keep going. And you end up at the Pool of Shalom. Pool of Shalom, Jesus, you know, remember he healed the guy with, with like spit on his eyes and put mud on his eyes. He says, I want you to walk down to the Pool of Shalom and, and, and wash off the mud there. 
So this procession would go down to the Pool of Shalom and the high priest would carry this golden pitcher and he would go down and he would scoop up the living water from the Pool of Shalom and he'd hold it high above his head and he'd make his way through the crowd and through the, thr through the throngs of people who would then fall in behind him and follow him back up to the temple shouting and chanting the Halal, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And once they got to the end of the Halal, it's like they would just stay put on one verse. Psalm 118, verse 25. It's like they would just stay on repeat and they would chant that in unison over and over and over again. And the Psalm 118, verse 25 says this, O Lord, save us. O Lord, let us prosper. And you can imagine 100,000, 200,000, 600,000 voices chanting this all in unison. The high priest would then make his way with the pitcher up to the altar. He'd march around the altar seven times, reminiscent of the people walking around the city of Jericho. And then a horn would sound and the people would fall silent. And the high priest would pour the water onto the altar and he'd hold the basin up. And this was a sign that God had heard their prayers and that God indeed one day would let living water flow from the temple. That is the Feast of Tabernacles. That is what is happening in Jerusalem in John chapter 7. The, the Mishnah, which is like a Jewish commentary, says this. He who has never seen the joy of the water drawing ceremony has never seen true joy. Enthralled people used to dance before the Lord, singing songs of praises all night. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. On the seventh and greatest day of the feast, the water ceremony would happen and the people would erupt in joy. Not just that God had taken them out of uh, Egypt, not just that God had provided for them a land, but that one day that God is going to let life flow through all the earth as living water. Now all this is going on in Jerusalem. John tells us that Jesus is up north in Galilee. And he's having this conversation with his flesh and blood siblings. And we read these words. So Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things... Show yourself to the world. Now, there is some sarcasm and there is some animosity in Jesus' siblings' words because they actually don't believe that he's the Messiah. And basically they're saying to him, if you're really this, you're really, this is who you are, stop hiding out in the Galilee and go down to Jerusalem, even though they want to kill you down there. Go down and make yourself known and do your works there. They're egging him on. Now, the reason for their contemptuousness, we see in verse 5, is, is because they just don't believe him. His own brothers failed to embrace him as their savior. And so you can imagine that Jesus just had a whole bunch of his followers leave him because of the whole zombie sermon, and now his flesh and blood don't believe him and kind of egging him on to, to go have a confrontation that could lead to his death in Jerusalem. And, and so we read that Jesus' brothers, they go down to to Jerusalem to participate in the festival, which they're supposed to do. And after they leave, it says, John tells us that Jesus goes too, but he goes in private. So you kind of imagine he goes in incognito. Right? He knows he's a wanted man in Jerusalem. He knows that all the people are going to be there, and he heads down to the city. And while, John tells us that while uh, in the city, there's all this talk about Jesus going on during the festival because you got people gathered from every part of you know of Israel and, and people have they've heard the stories about this miracle worker and, and maybe they've had a family member who was healed or or they knew somebody who knew somebody who had leprosy and or who was blind and Jesus healed them and or, or maybe they heard him speak and preach like nobody had ever spoken or preached before and so there's all this talk about who is this guy and what to make of him and you know there's all kinds of opinions and all kinds of ideas and speculation and debate and so all of this is going down during the Festival of Tabernacles. And we get to the final and last day of the feast. So the crowd are carrying their lulabs. They gather in the temple and they're chanting and they're singing the halal all together. They're following the priest out of the temple and down to the lower 
to lower city where he's got the golden pitcher where he'll scoop up the living water and he's making his way back up to the temple and the crowds are following him and when they get to the end of the halal which they would have before the the priest got back to the temple um, they, they get to Psalm 118 verse 25 and they just stop there and that just goes on repeat and they keep chanting O Lord save us O Lord let us prosper hundreds of thousands of voices now we don't have 100,000 voices but we have 150 so we're, we're gonna actually we're gonna we're gonna chant this together five or six times and I want you to, to do it with gusto. I mean, this is the height of celebration. Seven days of seven days of celebration. Seven days of remembering what God has done in the past. Seven days of anticipating the promises of what God is going to do in the future. You're at the height of ecstatic joy. All this, you know, people waving palm branches and all this celebration. So let's stand on up so we can get our lungs open. And like good Jews... We're not Jews, but like good Jews, imagine that you're there. All this anticipation, and I, I, let's, let's, let's celebrate this and pronounce this together as, you know, it's their act of prayer to God. Oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, let us prosper. Oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, let us prosper. Oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, let us prosper. Oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, let us prosper. So this, hundreds of thousands of voices are doing this. The, the, the priest is making his way up. This, the, the whole you know, temple is reverberating with all these voices. He's got the pitcher. He goes and he goes around the altar once and then twice, three times, seven times. On the seventh time, he stops at the altar and a horn sounds and it goes silent. And John says that at this moment, Jesus does the most dramatic thing. At this moment, breaking the silence is one voice that says this, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Jesus pierces the ceremony and says all this ritual, all this pageantry, all these prayers, all this celebration, all this history of festival is all for this moment. I'm the one it all points to. I'm the one it's all about. You can grab a seat. It's here. It has come. The living water is here. All you have to do is turn to me. I cannot think of a more powerful or a more dramatic moment. And you can imagine what the Jews must have been thinking. They're, they're just like murderous rage must have just because now he's just violated He's violated the sacred festival. He's interrupted it. He's hijacked it. He's made it about himself. He's ruined the ritual. There's a potential problem with rituals. Is that they actually have the potential to do the exact opposite of what they're supposed to do. Rituals are meant to make us look through them to something bigger. They're meant to be like a, 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 a peephole into something, you know, a, a, a vista that's far greater than the peephole. But rituals can also focus our gaze on the here and now, on the ritual, on the moment, on the right now, on the pageantry of the ritual. And when that happens, if we don't see the bigger thing, the ritual actually becomes a great enemy to us. It's like the guy who takes his marriage vows on Saturday and, and by Thursday he's hitting on his coworker. The ritual is just a ritual. It's like the woman that comes and, and, and takes the bread and the cup and, and takes communion and then fingers the guy who cuts her off in traffic on her way home. The, the, the ritual was meaningless. 
the ritual was just a ritual. Jesus is shouting out to everybody who will listen that there's something bigger than the ritual. That at this moment, the throngs, the people who are there, who have just undergone the pageantry and the production of the feast, the power of this symbolic act with hundreds of thousands of voices and palm branches being waved and the whole ceremony and the joy and the camp out and the living in booths and all that type of stuff. Jesus is saying, this was all for a purpose to point you to me. And so you've got this whole ritual that stands over here and Jesus that stands by himself. And he's saying, look through this to me. And some of them do, but a bunch of them don't. Because this, this has got, you know, all kinds of history and this has got this has got all kinds of symbolism and this has got all kinds of choreographed you know, acts and this is just one guy. One lone voice. And so the people at that moment on that day had to make a choice. Would they move past the ritual to the one who the ritual was pointing to which is Jesus? And here's the deal you do too. This is a ritual, what we're doing right now. We gather together, we break bread, we sing praises, we give our offerings, we listen to a sermon. But, but let's just be honest, this is a pretty anemic ritual. This is a pretty lame, powerless ritual. Like if somebody came to me and said, hey, do you want to go to a building and drink mediocre coffee? No offense, ladies. Drink, you know, mediocre coffee. His coffee's great, but... Our, our church is the exception. Do you want to go to a building and drink some coffee and sing songs with some strangers and listen to a lecture week after week? I'd be like, no thanks. Right? Because I can think of a whole bunch of better stuff to do with my Sunday than do that because that sounds pretty lame. That sounds pretty anemic. And on its own, it is. On its own, this is weak. But Sunday isn't about Sunday. Sunday isn't about ritual. Sunday isn't even about mountainside. Sunday is about Jesus. To point us to Jesus. To remind us to Jesus. To open us up so that we can experience more of Jesus. Not the historical figure, but the Jesus alive right now, today. Not just some facade of a ritual, but the living God in your life. And the Jews had a choice to make. They could stay with the ritual which was safe or they could go and follow the solitary voice who says that he was the one it was all pointing to and that was not safe. That was not predictable. They didn't know what that was going to mean. But one of them had living water and one of them just had a promise and a hope of living water. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I want to ask you to just evaluate how much of your spirituality is ritual. How much of it is rote habit. And, and, and how much does that leave you thirsty? <laughs> right? Right? Because even like me or Matt on our best day, we might quench your thirst until about four minutes into the parking lot. That's us at our best day. Because this doesn't quench a lot of thirst. But there is one who does. And so I'm going to ask you this week to just take some evaluation and say, how much of my spiritual pursuit is ritual? I just act on spiritual muscle memory. And how much am I actually coming to Jesus? How much am I actually believing in Him? And how much is there actual living water flowing from my life? Which is the evidence that we believe. So we'll dig into that next week. Sound good? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you and praise you 
that that prayer that rang out from the halal has been answered. Lord, you have saved us. You are Jesus. You are Yahshua. You are the God who saves. And we thank you, God, that you have come, that we would prosper, that we would know you, that we would have our humanity remade, that we'd be fully alive, fully human, that we would be able to thrive spiritually in relationship with you. That doesn't mean that life is easy. It doesn't mean that the bank account's full. It means that we're full, full with life, so much so that it flows out from us and other thirsty people find life as well. God, as we think and we reflect and we evaluate where we are, God, would you help us be mindful of where we have just got into a pattern of following rituals and not seeing through them to the bigger you that's behind them? God, I confess that I've been guilty of that, that I can fall into that thinking that my anticipation is, is, is about a service instead of about a savior. And so I ask, Lord, that as we think about this, you'd open up our hearts and prepare us to, to come and to weigh Jesus' incredible promise next week. That it would be true of us. That we would believe in you. And that life would bubble up within us. Your life would bubble up within us and flow out of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening.